Students, welcome back to developmental biology class. Um, so, today we will continue on the mechanisms uh, involved in uh, that is developmental mechanisms that are the basis for evolutionary uh, adaptation. Okay. So, yesterday I uh, briefly introduced um, you know four types of changes. You know, I briefly mentioned that the differences in the sequen genome sequence itself is um, th the differences are not so much compared to the uh, changes in the morphology and other uh, aspects of uh, different groups of organisms. And, uh, and those differences actually come from not the sequence difference per se, but from changes in the sequence that determines where a gene is expressed and when it is expressed and for how long it is expressed. By varying those things, uh, you know, most of the anatomical and morphological differences are brought about. Okay. And in addition, changes of course in protein sequence also matters. And uh, these changes can be grouped into four groups and they are heterotopy that is change in location and heterochrony change in time and heterometry change in the amount. Um, heterotypy is actually the protein sequence change like the type, the new function, change in the function itself. Okay. So, we will see examples of each of this and that will make uh, these concepts uh, clearer and um, so, we will proceed from there. So, first let us take up uh, heterotopy, okay, change in location. So, how change in location of a expression of a gene can actually lead to anatomical and morphological changes within a lineage and therefore, uh, variations are possible with a given uh, theme of body plan. Okay. Okay, so, this is an example that is familiar to you. So, we discussed this when we were talking about uh, the link between von Bayer's principles and Darwin's theory of uh, you know descent with modification. Okay. So, there we discussed um, how one could look at the uh, diversity among organisms and uh, think about the variations that has been uh, the, the, that have been uh, developed over a long period of time or one could look at the embryonic similarities okay so very diverse adult features but if you go back to the embryos of the same organisms there is lot of similarity and you one could uh, look at those embryonic similarities and think about how uh, you know the descent that is uh, you know a evolutionary progression of one species giving rise to another species and so on uh, has happened by modifying the same thing okay and that is why the early stages of embryos have similarities so how is a very similar thing can be varied um, to uh, generate the adaptations so, you could look at both diversity as well as unity. So, that is the context in which we saw this example earlier. So, we will revisit the same example as an example of um, change in location of gene expression. Okay. So, if you look at the left top image, this is a mouse and you have the digits or the fingers okay, of the four limb. So, there are five of them. Uh, but there are, they are independent. Okay, there are no web-like connection um, between two fingers. Okay, so they are separate. But whereas if you look at this uh, right image top, and this is again four limb, so you see two changes, uh, two obvious differences. One is the length of the fingers. So, here again numbered. See, number one is extremely short compared to the other ones. And they are all except number one lot longer than the ones that you see in, uh, in the mouse. Okay. Both are mammals, the forelimb modification. So, they are obviously very, very different. So, the variation is very obvious. 
but it is by modifying a slight change in what you already have. So, for um, you know the, to get rid of the web like thing that starts if you look at the lower panel the top uh, or the bottom if you compare those two you see both of them have similar limb bud and that expands to make this um, you know uh, finger like structures and the web exists if you look at the third image among um, in between both of them. But as time progresses here the web disappears and here the web does not disappear and that is primarily because a change in location of expression of this gene FGF8 and this FGF8 is expressed in the interdigital uh, tissue only in the um, bat but not in mouse and due to that uh, BMP you know uh, one of the TGF beta member is suppressed in the web area in the bat this ectopic expression of FGF8. So, this is a heterotopy ok it is not expressed in another mammal in the same area and due to that BMP is not expressed and as a result uh, BMP which normally promotes uh, apoptosis meaning programmed cell death in the interdigital web that is not active and as a result no apoptosis no cell death therefore, the web persists. On the other hand here no FGF8 and due to that BMP is active and BMP promotes apoptosis. So, the web cells die and the web disappears ok. So, this is how adaptation you know uh, converting your hand into bat wing so that it could fly. So, you see a big change a big adaptation but coming from this modular use of uh, one gene being expressed in one place and that is having only the effect only in that place ok. So, here uh, FGF8 is expressed in a location where it is normally not expressed in closely related other mammals. So, that is why it is an example of heterotopy. So, this is how the bat got its wing it is no big deal just one gene expression in a different place. And the next one is even more dramatic example um, again you will see how very simple molecular changes actually can account for profound anatomical change and therefore, a new evolutionary adaptation. So, here we are going we are looking at how the turtle got its shell ok. So, the turtle is again like uh, other um, vertebrates closely related vertebrates, but other vertebrates have a rib cage protecting you know the internal organs like lungs and heart in human. Um, but turtle does not have it instead it seemed to have that rib cage converted to be a bony structure on the back which is its uh, shell ok. So, let us see how such a major change you know instead of rib cage having a uh, turtle shell. So, if you look at it when this uh, you know El, uh, Eoli structure starts to form um, in the this is the dorsal or uh, ep epidermal area. So, there uh, this area expresses FGF10 ok. So, this is an ectopic expression or okay, heterotopy again a different place normally it is not expressed. And this FGF10 expression on the dorsal epithelium attracts um, the. So, here you have uh, this is the bright field image and this is uh, in situ hybridization image for FGF10. So, FGF signal is seen at the edges here. And this draws the rib uh, primordium to grow towards this region. So, instead of going down it goes up because the signal it is attractive key a signal FGF10 is expressed here. So, due to that a rib grows into this area and when the rib grows into that area what rib does uh, is to make bone and therefore, here it secretes this uh, BMP uh, bone morphogenetic factor and the dermal that is the skin cells 
are capable of responding to uh, BMP and when you respond to BMP you make a uh, bone you know that is what its name is bone morphogenetic factor. So, the uh, you got rib into this area plus the rib converted the skin into bone here and that is how turtle uh, shell forms. So, this is a cross section of a later stage embryo. So, this is the rib that has nicely grown here and um, uh, then uh, a much later stage you see here uh, this red color it is uh, stained with a dye that uh, stains bone and you can see wherever the rib has grown in those areas new bone starts to form. Okay. So, this is how turtle got its uh, shell due to heterotopic expression of FGF10 and that alone seems to be enough given the basic body plan of a vertebrate the body plan meaning being the rib uh, cage being normally formed and that could be modified by simply changing the expression of one signaling molecule. Okay. So, these were uh, really good examples of heterotopy you know uh, change in gene expression leading to uh, a, a major uh, variation in the you know uh, anatomy and morphology leading to different adaptations evolutionary adaptations. So, this is a one more example. So, this is third I think this is the last example of um, hetero no we have one more um, yes. So, we will look at two more examples of heterotopy. Okay. So, this, so, we saw how bat got its wings and we saw how uh, turtle got its shell. Now, we will also see how birds got their feathers. Okay. So, these are evolutionarily novel structures you know only birds have wings uh, with the feathers um, and you do not see that kind of a wing uh, elsewhere in the among the vertebrates. And uh, so, if for a long time uh, evolutionary biologists uh, sort of knew that the modification of reptilian scales remember I told a few classes ago that uh, birds and mammals uh, are descendants of uh, two different uh, uh, reptilian ancestors. Okay. So, that reptilian uh, scale you know I am sure you know reptiles like if you look at lizard or uh, snake you they all have um, I am sorry not snake um, like uh, like crocodile if you look at them they have nice scales ok. And modification of those scales is what uh, happened in birds to make the feathers. So, that is determined by the expression domain of again we are seeing an um, you know uh, BMP uh, ortholog. So, this is the BMP2 and sonic Hedgecock. So, we have learnt about Hedgecock pathway uh, quite some time ago at the very early classes. So, these two are expressed in these domains as cartooned here on the top left that is how it is in the scales or uh, in reptiles. But in birds their expression spatial uh, expression domains are changed such that it leads to a mound like structure and that finally creates uh, two adjacent instead of two separate uh, domains of expression you get two adjacent domains of expression and that leads to this tube like feather formation in the very ancient um, you know reptile to bird transition. And once these tube like structures form and again uh, by setting up different similar domains um, of these two gene expression you create axis from which you then derive uh, branched feathers or a central rachis with which you have these structures attached all by changing the expression domains of these two genes in as this structure proceeds. So, so this is another example of heterotopy. And uh, the last example that we are going to look at are uh, examples of um, uh, is an example of how the snake lost its uh, forelimb. Okay. Uh, so, it lost its hind limb through a different mechanism. So, the, that I will explain separately. First, let us focus on how it lost its forelimbs. So, first of all, you need to understand that the snakes evolved from um, 
you know, uh, tetrapod ancestor having four limbs. Um, the, you know, two at the front and two at the back. So, two four limbs and two hind limbs. So, it, it, it originated from a tetrapod and uh, during the course of evolution, it lost its uh, limbs. So, how did it lose its four limbs? Uh, quite simple. So, we already know uh, Hawks genes and we know Hawks code uh, which states that the combination of Hawks genes determine the segment identity along the anterior to posterior axis. So, here if you look at it, so this is the you know fossil skeleton of an ancestral snake, you can see it is a hind limb, uh, very short structure, but nevertheless you can make out the limb structure here, ok. So, the bones you can very neatly make out. Um, but the primary thing is this. So, it seemed to have rib all over the body. So, the Hawks genes that are responsible to make the rib cage, they are expressed throughout the body in snakes. So, it is as simple as that. So, if you look at the, so this cartoon explains the expression domain uh, in chick, ok. So, you have this Hawks C, that is the third gene, 8 paralog. And uh, the another parallel, Hox C6. So, these when they overlap, you have the flank, the middle, uh, you know, part of the body. And if you have um, Hox 6, uh, where it ends, its domain of expression ends, you have the forelimb. And similarly, where you have the Hox C8 uh, ends, you get the hind limb. So, this is the expression pattern that determines the initiation of four limbs. So, essentially you should not have Hox uh, C6 to initiate the four limb. But if you look at the, you know, an, an ancestral snake like python, what happens is both of them are expressed all through. That is because Hox 6 does not get expressed without Hox 8 and in this case they both express all through. And when they both express, you, you make the ribs and as a result, you make rib-like vertebrae all the way, you know, from the anterior to posterior and that is how the snake skeleton is formed. So, this is how, uh, you know, no forelimb here, ok. Hox 6 C should be absent to make forelimb, but here you have heterotopic expression of Hox 6 C, as a result, forelimbs are lost. Okay, the hind limbs are lost primarily due to the the limb bud, you know, structure like um, what we saw with the bat and the mouse a uh, few slides. So yeah, so this is what we call as limb bud. So that kind of a structure. In that structure, um, sonic hedgehog expression is lost, and that sonic uh, hedgehog is required for the limb bud to grow. And due to the loss of that. Um, uh, for hind limbs are also lost in the modern day snakes. So, this is how snakes uh, lost their limbs, ok. Again a heterotopic expression of um, uh, genes. So, the next one we are going to see, so now we saw change, spatial expression change. Next we are going to see an example of temporal expression change, meaning time difference, ok, when is it expressed and for how long it is expressed, ok. So, both are important, if, it, if something is to be expressed for uh, a, a short period at a certain developmental stage, instead if it is expressed for a longer period. So, that is also heterochrony, crony, chronology, chronometer, ok. So, the word derives from that, that is how it, it connects to time, uh, change in time, heterochrony. And um, so, the, the actual start of expression can be at different time point. Also, the duration of expression can also vary. So, both kind of chronological changes are possible and both can lead to uh, anatomical and morphological changes within a single uh, lineage. And we will see couple of examples here. The first one we kind of saw. Uh, but we did not uh, focus on this particular feature. We, we looked at the snake 
only thinking about why it does not have the limbs. But what we did not seriously think is why is it long, you know why it has too many vertebrae and that is because this uh, during the rib development the segmentation reaction cycles um, nearly four times faster than the rest of the tissue rest of the embryonic tissue growth when you compare with what happens between the cycle times compared to the rest of the embryonic development in other vertebrates okay so so whatever be the rate of uh, segmentation cycle compared to the rest of the embryo in other vertebrates in snakes it, that rate is four times faster as a result it ends up creating many segments and forms a lot of vert vertebrae okay so that is one example and another example here we are seeing is um, uh, what, uh, what is called a hyperphalange so the, this is common among uh, cetacean mammals you know whale and dolphin like mammals so it will be interesting for you to uh, you know as a homework uh, read upon and find out what were the evolutionary ancestors of these mammals that have gone back to marine environment ok um, so I will not go into explaining that evolutionary ancestry of these uh, cetaceans cetaceans is a common name for uh, whale like organisms and um, so in them uh, the phalanges phalanges means like your finger is a digit ok one digit two digit three four five and then you have bone structure within it you know one two three uh, uh, four and so on so th these bones at which you are able to uh, you know turn your finger so this is one phalange this is another phalange ok so these phalanges can be longer or shorter so that sort of a variation is possible ok so when it is longer you call that as hyperphalange and that is what has happened in the four limbs of uh, uh, cetaceans here is an example of dolphin we are looking at digit 2 and 3 in dolphin so these phalanges have become long and therefore it could make a long flipper ok when, when a four limb like ours converted into um, you know a, a fin like structure they are called flippers as opposed to fins in the fish so fish fin did not evolve by converting a four limb like ours into a fin like structure and therefore these are called flippers just to distinguish that these are called flippers ok and in the dolphin flipper if you look at the digits 2 and 3 are very long and that is because these phalanges expanded more compared to what happens in closely related mammals and that is because this epical ectodermal ridge ok so the skin forming cells they maintained a signal secretion ability which promotes this phalanges to grow and due to that you know they extend uh, uh, long so so they are they are expressed for longer period of time ok so here it is not ectopic expression so they are normally needed for the phalanges to grow it is just that they stayed too long and as a result the phalanges become longer ok so it is chronological that is temporal variation longer time it existed and that is why you have uh, long digits in these dolphins um, so and then you see uh, uh, yeah, the same thing uh, one more uh, example in the same group is that the limb bud so the limb bud how long the limb bud continues to grow also uh, it facilitates the longer uh, you know phalanges and ending up in longer digits so this limb bud growing as we saw um, when we were discussing about the hind limb of uh, snakes so the sonic hedgehog expression in that um, uh, you know epical ectodermal ridge uh, or the limb bud in this case is the reason for it 
So, if the sonic Hitchcock expression duration, okay, so again, chrono, uh, heterochrony we are talking about, the duration when it is shorter, it ends up forming very short hind limbs and therefore, the for this, this kind of a digital structure is not shown, it ends up forming shorter uh, limb, shorter digits, okay. So, this is what is found in, uh, in the whale hind limbs, okay. But if you look at an, uh, uh, you know, an, an ancestral whale like uh, Archaeocetus, so there uh, you have a normal level of uh, Sony Hedgehog expression and as a result, uh, a normal limb growth and this we take as a reference normal here, okay, compared to this, this is shorter and this is longer. So, here the sonic Hitchcock expression remains for longer period of time as a result everything ends up being longer, okay. So, th this is how, so the limb uh, development promoting gene that is sonic Hitchcock as well as signals that promote the higher phalange uh, growth both staying longer ended up having longer limb with longer digits, okay. So, this is how the whales got their flippers, a good example of heterochrony. So, um, so we look at um, now uh, a different uh, mechanism which is heterometry, okay. So, the amount varying, so, so the uh, amount of uh, uh, you know gene expression like the protein product being less or more can also vary the tissue changes. So, here in each one of these you see the developmental modules uh, helping in varying certain structures without varying rest of the embryo and these variations of certain structures are essential adaptations, okay. So, here what we are seeing is an example of um, you know uh, an interesting uh, fish species uh, that lives in um, you know underwater caves with absolutely no light there and it has no use for eyes. Uh, but it is not that it does not want to have eyes, but to develop other senses to be able to live in um, uh, that kind of an environment whatever modification needed ended up eliminating eyes, okay. So, let us see this example of um, heterometry. So, so this is uh, you know a normal um, you know uh, mouse embryo here, uh, it is the head re region like you are looking uh, at its head from the front, okay. You are facing it and you are looking at the top portion, so you are looking here, okay. Um, so, this is where the nose are going to, no, the two nose cavity are going to form and this is where the eye is going to develop, okay. This optical vesicle is going to form here, okay. And you have two of this and that is because during embryonic development, uh, this structure cartooned here, this orange structure, okay, precordial plate and this one produces uh, sonic Hitchcock, again the same gene, which actually inhibits uh, PAC6 expression. As you are very familiar already, PAC6 is required for the optic vesicle uh, development, lens formation and so on, okay. So, it is essentially PAC6 equals eye development, no PAC6, no eye. And this normal level of uh, sonic Hitchcock ends up inhibiting PAC6 in the central region as a result this eye field splits into two, okay. So, PAC6 is inhibited in the center but allowed expression on the two sides. So, you, ends up, you end up getting two eyes, okay. So, now uh, if you remember uh, Hedgecock is cholesterol modified and if we inhibit cholesterol biosynthesis like using this germane alkaloid then the Hedgecock signaling will be reduced. So, if you partially reduce uh, Hedgecock signaling, then what happens? The field does not split well, 
uh, you know, compared to this. So these remain close and the, the nasal cavity does not bifurcate and it forms kind of a weird structure here. And if you totally abolish uh, Hedgecock, then the split does not happen and you get one single eye uh, developing here, okay, well, a condition called cyclopia. So, this is because PAC 6 expression has not been reduced in the center. So, this is what happens when you reduce the quantity of expression. So, this is a mutant condition we are talking about, this is not an evolutionary adaptation. So, this is our uh, background preparation to understand how the cave fish lost its eye which uh, I just uh, uh, mentioned at the beginning. So, we will see that in the next one. So, here is the result uh, where you have no sonic hedgecock. Now, let us think of a situation where you have too much of sonic hedgecock. So, in the uh, suppressing pack 6 only at the center, now you have it suppressed all over meaning no eye uh, optic vesicle forming and therefore absolutely no eye and that is what happened in the cave fish. So, this is a uh, surface dwelling fish in the same area belonging to the uh, same group, you know they are very closely related species and um, uh, this one you know lived in the caves for more than 10,000 years and it had no use for light. But that was not the reason it lost the eye, what it really, uh, the, uh, the change in gene expression that really helped it to adapt to that cave environment was actually making bigger jaw and uh, better sense of taste and these two were useful adaptations in the, uh, in, in the dark environment B uh, and that was helped by more expression of sonic hedgecock, okay. So, the quantity we are talking about heterometry, right. So, more expression and as a result its downstream targets like uh, patched 2 and Pax 2. So, compared to the surface dwelling of fish's embryo, so these dark colors of the ex uh, their expression stain and here you see it is a bigger domain. And that is what leads to a bigger jaw and bigger more taste buds, it is gustatory sense is much more than this one. And uh, due to that uh, expression of sonic hedgecock, the pack 6 you see this big area of pack 6 forming the optic vesicle and that is really not there here. And the pax 2 which is expressed very little here is expressed more and this is what leads to having more taste buds and so a quantitatively more expression of sonic hedgecock which helped in adapting to the cave environment by making bigger jaws led to the loss of um, light sensing organ eye which did not matter because it had no uh, use for the eyes anyway in that environment. So, this is how a, a, a quantitative variation also. Uh, you know has helped in the evolution to modify the same uh, you know basic um, developmental module here. Here it is the eye field ok. So, eye field still exists it is just that by changing one gene expression it has been modified uh, into that required variation. So, this is the you know the, the, uh, the famous examples of uh, Darwin's uh, finches ok. So, these are birds that live in Galapagos Islands where uh, Darwin visited uh, during his voyage of the South America in the early 1800s I think 1835 I guess if I am if my memory is right around that time he visited Galapagos Islands and there he saw these variations in closely related um, uh, you know birds um, uh, which, which are called finches ok. So, these are barbless uh, related um, birds from the South American mainland that got uh, and they got adapted to different islands based on what food source was available there. And that is primarily by modifying um, the three dimensional aspects of the beak ok. So, you can vary, so this is the three dimension you know it is width, 
can be more height uh, you know this is called the depth can be more or the length can be more. So, by varying this uh, this structure in three dimension by changing the level of protein expression you know both heterochronic as well as heterometric variations are uh, led to variations of this beak and that is what we are going to see here. So, the first example we are going to see is actually heterochronic and heterometric variation. So, this gene is going to be expressed for longer or shorter time and also more or less quantity both variations we are going to see and the gene again is a familiar gene you know it is a small tool kit it is not like a whole lot of uh, tools that are being used it is BMP again. So, so, if you look at uh, the, this, these are the uh, ground finches. So, these things um, you know poke open the seeds that are lying on the ground and then they eat the contents of the seeds. So, then they need to break hard shells. So, they need the you know um, a deeper and wider but shorter uh, beaks that helps in breaking open the seed cases. And that is made possible by having more BMP expression in the this is the embryonic um, the you know frontonasal mesenchyme area um, that area in the embryo you have more BMP expression and then you get really deeper and wider beak ok. But then it is shorter and that gives it uh, you know um, uh, application of more force in breaking the seeds. Uh, and then you see this one slightly smaller and it has slightly less expression and further smaller it has even less expression, but these have far lower expression. So, these are the cactus uh, finches. So, these have uh, tapered long uh, beaks that help them uh, you know search inside the flowers cactus flowers for insects and other stuff ok. So, these benefited by having longer and narrower beaks or uh, the cactus uh, finches and these benefited the ground uh, finches benefited by having uh, shorter, but wider and deeper uh, that is these two dimension uh, more pronounced and this variation is made possible by having uh, varying quantities of BMP4 ok and that is the heterometry. But in these species the expression starts very early as well ok. So, expression starts earlier compared to these and expressed more compared to these. And the uh, finches uh, beak story does not end there. So, there is one more molecule we are going to look at and by playing the concentrations of these two you can really create varieties of beaks ok. Uh, it gives you a three dimensional coordinate uh, for the co relative concentrations of these two molecules and therefore, you can generate really really uh, you know amazing variety of uh, beak uh, sizes and shapes ok. That molecule is calmodulin. So, calmodulin is a protein that uh, senses calcium meaning it binds to calcium and then interacts with other proteins and modify their activity. So, that is why it is called calmodulin. So, the calmodulin expression also matters. So, here in, in when it comes to the beak length uh, calmodulin and BMP4 act as if they are antagonists meaning we just saw that uh, more BMP shorter beak ok although it is wider and uh, deeper. Uh, with calmodulin the opposite is true more the calmodulin longer the beak ok. So, more calmodulin and less uh, BMP4 you get longer uh, uh, beak as you see here in the cactus uh, finches at the bottom of the, this. So, here you see in that uh, primordial embryonic primordial structure you have lot more calmodulin expressed compared to the ones as you go up. So, up to this um, so these two are the cactus finches. So, they have tapered longer beaks and these are the ground ones. So, this obviously has lot of BMP4 which started expressing early as well 
and here you have uh, less scale modeling compared to these. And uh, as you go further, then you have a uh, very uh, really low amount of cal modeling uh, that makes shorter beaks. Okay. And this is explained further here. So, this is like the ancestral uh, board from the um, uh, South American mainland where, pro where probably it was doing both, you know, breaking some seeds as well as probing some flowers and that had low level of both and it had this shape. So, this is like the starting point ancestral and by varying the uh, you know quantity of uh, both these protein expression and then the duration of um, you know BMP4 expression like when it starts early like you know heterochronic here in terms of when it starts. By varying these two you create all these variations. Okay. So, uh, in, in one case uh, the in the cactus uh, finches you have low BMP and high cal modeling and as a result you have longer uh, beaks that are narrower. Therefore, it can readily get deeper into the flower and search through the flower structures. Okay. And then you have um, some that that is not so specialized to probe the flowers so deep and they have slightly more BMP4 than these and slightly more uh, uh, you know cal modeling than sorry same level of cal modeling as this or slightly lower amount of cal modeling. But as you progress towards this crushing seeds you have more some more BMP4 and but less cal modeling and as a result you have medium ground uh, finches you know this is not that deeper or uh, wider compared to these, but it is deeper and wider and shorter compared to these. And when you have really high BMP4 and really low cal modeling then you, uh, you get a shorter beak that is wider and deeper. So, this can really break and uh, crush uh, hard and large seeds. Okay. So, so here what we are seeing is a, a significant anatomical variation has been generated by simply varying the timing and the quantity of just couple of molecules. So, th th this is how you connect morphology, uh, molecular biology via developmental mechanisms to evolutionary adaptation. Okay. So, without understanding the developmental mechanisms of how beak forms and the underlying molecular uh, biology that is the expression of these molecules and what these molecules do, you are not going to be able to explain how these adaptations have happened actually during the course of evolution. So, this is the connection between developmental mechanisms and evolutionary adaptation. So, here you have uh, you are throwing up you know in a population enormous variations. So, the natural selection can select among those variations and these variations have been generated in three dimensional uh, simply by varying the uh, expression pattern of two different proteins. So, there is a small uh, variation in the theme of heterometry and that small variation is allometry. Okay. So, till now we were seeing quantitative variation. So, the next one we are going to see is um, the quantitational variation of a structure with respect to the rest of the uh, embryo that, that is what we are going to call here. The different um, parts grow at different rates as a result one part becomes way too big compared to the rest of it. It is not proportional compared to an, an ancestral uh, organism in the same lineage. Okay. So, that is allometry. So, so we will see this through a couple of examples. So, one example I do not have images here to show, but if you look at um, you know your uh, toes, uh, your foot you know the, the toes the five uh, toes that you have or your forelimb hand your five uh, digits or five fingers and compare that with the horse. Okay. Horse is also tetrapod. 
So there what do you see? You, you do not see 5 fingers. So I am not sure how many of you know. Um, horses have only one single toe okay, since it uses both the uh, pairs of limbs as um, legs, we do not call them fingers, we only call toes. So, it is single toed. So, as if these are all gone and only one finger is there or one toe in the foot is there and that is an allometric growth, okay, one being so dominant compared to the rest. But even in your own toe, if you look down and look at it, the middle ones are uh, longer than the one at one end like this, uh, you know, um, uh, th they are not of the same size and that is because of allometric uh, growth of um, the interdigital uh, regions and that is what uh, led to the uh, eventually in horses led to uh, one finger being it is actually the uh, functional foot. The other example we are going to see uh, is again we go back to the whales, okay. So, whales are mammals, so they have lungs like us, so it breathes air, it does not have the gill apparatus and uh, you know take oxygen from water. So, how do they breathe? You know it, it lives in the sea and it is um, you know all the time there. So, it should be able to breathe very comfortably while swimming, it should not need to turn its head up and down, uh, up and down as we swim, okay. And that is done by an, a very interesting allometry. So, that is illustrated in the next slide. So, here uh, is the comparison, okay. So, this uh, lower jaw or the mandible uh, is not shown here for the whale. Otherwise, this whole structure is uh, shown here and where I want you to draw, draw your attention is look at this upper jaw or the maxilla, okay. So, this has grown too long compared to the rest of the craniofacial structure, okay. So, that is the allometry. So, it, it is not proportional compared to the rest of it like as you see in another vertebrate this has grown too long. So, probably the primordial cells that produce this uh, were more sensitive to a certain signal and therefore, they responded more or that signal was produced more in this organism compared to here and as a result this grew longer. So, the, the same structure significantly varied, okay. What is the big deal of making this grow big? just think what will happen if you make this grow, this goes to the top. So, the nasal cavity opens um, you know on the top. So, why it could be comfortably swimming without uh, turning its uh, head left and right all the time and it can breathe, okay. So, its, its nose is on the top of its head instead of on the side. So, this is an example of allometry, the maxillary bone grew lot more than the rest of the body, okay. So, the difference in the proportion here that is why it is called allometry. So, the last uh, kind of variation that we are going to see is not in uh, changing the timing or space or the quantity, instead changing the molecule itself, okay, the protein sequence itself changing. So, that is what is heterotypy. So, we will see some examples of heterotypy in the next few slides. So, here is one uh, good case in example, okay. Um, so, if you look at insects, you, you may be thinking oh insects have too many legs compared to me, okay. So, you have uh, let us say take counting the our hands also, we have four limbs and uh, they have six, so they have more, but instead of asking they have more, you should actually look at its close relatives like you know centipede and uh, millipede, they have lot more legs, every segment is producing a pair of legs while here only the thoracic segments produce legs. So, why not the abdominal segments, why not the head segments, what happened? And that is because uh, you have the variation in this ultra bithorax, okay. So, ultra bithorax of uh, insects in the protein sequence 
um, has a more a polyalanine stretches as marked here. Okay, so this is like uh, Drosophila ultra by thorax. Uh, again, to refresh your memory, it's a posterior Hox gene, you know, homeotic gene. And uh, in its it, so the homeo domain itself is very well conserved. But if you look at the C terminal region, so you uh, due to uh, a mutation, um, you know, uh, somewhere in this ancestor, uh, it uh, ended up adding lot more polyalanine. You know, probably because you know due to a splice junction difference or due to change in the stop codon, it extended into further sequence, adding up more polyalanines. So, what is the big deal of having polyalanines? This polyalanine stretch in the C terminus of ultra bithorax ends up inhibiting this distal less, okay, the gene that we talked about yesterday. So, distal less we have multiple copies, um, you know, each one expressing in different uh, locations. We saw this in the last class. Uh, but in uh, insects, have only one, and when that is inhibited, then um, that leads to uh, the inhibition of um, leg development in other segments. Okay. So, so the posterior uh, segments can, which are controlled by the ultra by thorax, their distal less is not expressed and as a result, uh, you do not form the legs. And whereas these do not have that, they have normal distal less expression, which stimulates the leg formation in all the segments. And that is how um, you have the in uh, you have insects having lost the uh, legs in the posterior segments. So, this is um, you know on a, this is an example of the protein sequence varying heterotypy variation in the type. So, this is another uh, good example. So, this again very recently only we discussed about uh, how um, this uh, you know in placental mam mammals or uh, this extensive uh, connection between the mother and the fetus via what we call placenta having decidua and chorion right so we learned a lot from the embryo's point of view but let us look at from the mother's point of view you have to modify the ov duct into a large uterus and the uterus epithelium uh, should be able to, uh, you know, form the blood vessels to get nutrients towards the embryo, and it should be able to accommodate the embryo itself, and it also promotes the tropoblast uh, proliferation, uh, which help in help the embryo in getting implanted in the uterine wall. So, all these are all significant modification of the uterus epithelium and that is made possible in these vertebrates, you know, the, the mammalian vertebrates uh, by producing a hormone called a prolactin, okay. So, how do you end up producing more prolactin only in mammals and that is simply by changing uh, a subtle change in the protein sequence of a Hox gene. So, the, this Hox gene we discussed in the last class also Hox A11 and the Hox A11 of placental mammals have significant uh, changes from the other Hox A11 uh, other vertebrates such that this Hox A11 of placental mammals have acquired the ability to interact with this transcription factor Fox O1A. And this Fox O1A, when bound by uh, Hox A11, activates prolactin expression. And the prolactin hormone is enough to do all those modifications I described just now about the uterus epithelium. Okay. And this is an experimental illustration of that. So, here is a uh, you know a reporter, uh, a, a control, a non specific. Um, 
uh, protein that does not induce prolactin expression. Here you have just the human HOXA11, but no FOXO1A and that does not again promote prolactin. And here you have FOXO1A alone with no uh, human HOXA and that also does not promote prolactin expression. But when you have both, now you have lot of prolactin produced and you keep the FOXO1A from human but use a different placental mammal mouse that also does it and use uh, any eutherian mammal they also do it. But then if you go back to the non-placental mammals if you take therian, opossum, platypus or bird they do not do it ok. It is the placental ok these three placental mammal hawks A11 that is capable of interacting with FOXO1A and promoting prolactin expression. So, this, this is how, uh, by, by uh, you know a sequence variation on the same basic protein that is the heterotypy that led to um, a change in anatomy and as a result an evolutionary adaptation ok. So, if you consider the anatomical changes here, it is dramatic you know making a placenta and having an embryo grow in your body, uh, just look at the birds, they just throw it away, insects do the same thing, reptiles do the same thing, but mammals keep the embryo in them and that requires an enormous change and all of that does not require a wholesale reworking of the fundamental body plan you just need to vary a little bit and that could be accomplished by varying um, you know subtle changes in the function of a protein here by changing the protein uh, um, function ok not the expression time or spatial changes. And um, so, this is how uh, placental mammals have developed that adaptation. So, this is an, uh, another example of heterotypy ok. Um, so, so I, I have one more example that is from the plants. So, this is a remarkable thing here again I'm, I will not have the time to explain the whole detail of the evolutionary history of this amazing crop ok. So, in India you we, we may not be uh, dependent on this crop maize a lot for our uh, food source you know if we are unable to grow maize uh, we are not going to have a famine. But in, uh, in other parts of the world for example, if you take North America and the North American maize exported to U Europe in both these places they are heavily dependent on maize ok. It is an important crop it is just that it is fed secondarily ok. So, you do not directly eat the maize, uh, maize is fed to cows and then the beef industry um, provides the you know meat to the human population. So, it is the a large part of human population uh, uh, is dependent on this particular crop. So, it is worth your time to find out how crop uh, this uh, maize evolved you know is it a natural selection or was there any human intervention. So, go ahead and uh, figure it out on your own how this happened. But here we are going to use this as an example for heterotypy ok. Um, so, th this corn if you look at its base um, at the each one of these kernel. So, each one of this is a kernel. So, this whole structure is cob the top portion does not have the kernels and this is attached to the kernel and at that place there is a covering which is not visible here in the next one I will show you. So, this portion this white structure. So, here the kernel is removed and you only see this cover. This cover is called gloom ok g l u m e gloom uh, spelt here ok. So, if this gloom is really big and seriously protecting this kernel it is not easy to harvest it ok. And this is how the ancestral a uh, monocot from which this organism came about looked like. So, it has a very hard fully protective seed cover 
and this is its gloom ok. And in this uh, plant, this plant is called teosin tape. So, in that if you express the, uh, ma the normal maze uh, version of this gene called teosintic gloom architecture 1 or TGA1, uh, which is uh, the difference between this gene sequence in maize and this teosintate, the its ancestor is just one amino acid, okay. One amino acid change, um, a, a lysine to asparagine change uh, leads to gloom being very short and as a result it exposes the kernel. So, here uh, instead of asparagine when you have lysine it is big and closes. So, this uh, in B uh, you are seeing the wild type uh, teosinte and then here what you have is the maize allele uh, you know through genetic crosses gotten into this and as a result instead of this hard and fully covering gloom this makes a soft and uh, e short one and this seed is more exposed ok. So, this is what happens just one amino acid mutation and um, you know uh, a, a dramatic change and this is better shown in this uh, mutant version. So, this is the so called wild type it is because wild type this is we are growing and here this is how the gloom is and when you have that one amino acid mutation the gloom is very big and it covers the seed very thoroughly. This can also be obtained by taking instead of this experiment where this one's allele got introduced into this and that ended up being here instead if we take this one and introduce into this, this is what you get ok. So, a change in one amino acid and therefore change in the type of the same basic protein you have the gloom being bigger or smaller and that is an adaptation ok. So, um, so with this I I will stop for this lecture. In the next lecture what we are going to do is now that we are familiar with uh, uh, developmental mechanisms of certain body parts how they are formed and how you can vary them. Now, we are going to uh, look at the constraints of this body plan ok and how those constraints uh, end up limiting the variations in the adaptations that are possible ok. Every possible structure that would help an environment may not be possible given these developmental mechanisms of the existing structures ok. So, we need to remember natural selection does not produce any structure any new structures. Natural selection selects among the variations that exist uh, based on which variation fits in a given environment. So, that means those variations must already exist and from what we have learned so far it becomes abundantly clear that there will be limits to the types of variations that are possible and as a result among what structures are can evolve and cannot evolve can actually be predicted and those developmental constraints that actually provide uh, a trajectory to evolution is what is going to be the topic of our next lecture.